you. Thank you for inviting me here. Uh, my today's talk is based on our joint work with Alexei Kanelbelov, Sergei Plotkin, and Elia Lips. And it is called Towards Group Wide Smoke Insulation Theory for Reads. So I'll start with the general context of our work. Well, it's well known that in group theory there exist the classic problems uh, of studying big groups with unusual prescribed properties. And I mentioned uh, several famous problems. The first is Burnside problem that we already considered in this conference. And well, let me mention that it has two, in fact, two cases. The first is called general Burnside problem, and it is about finitely generated torsion group without any bound of the exponent. And it was solved by Gold and Chukarevich. And another case is bounded Burnside problem, uh, that is studying of three groups with their identity x to the n is equal to 1. And it was solved first by Novik of Adyan using combinatorial methods, and then by Alshansky using geometrical methods. And using the same methods, Alshansky also solved another famous uh, problem, construction of Tarski monster group, group with very intuitively unusual property, group with non-cyclic group with all proper subgroups being cyclic of even fixed prime order. And, well, I would like to say that the main behind main idea of Alshansky that stands uh, behind his proofs is generalized small consolation theory. <coughs> and also I would like to state the open problem of this class, usually it's called angle problem, and it was stated by uh, Maris Plotkin, I, I guess 60 years ago or something like that. It's like similar to Burnside problem, but for <coughs> another identity. So we take this identity commutator x, y, 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 n times. Uh, and the problem is to construct a finitely generated non-important non group which satisfies this identity. And this problem is still open. There is some attempts to solve this problem. Uh, in particular, Ilya Riggs has a big research on this topic, <coughs> but still it is not formally written, so it still stays open. And let me notice also that this angle problem and its possible solution, in fact, also based in uh, generalized small constellation ideas and groups. But well, I think for this audience, this group uh, problems are not so surprising. I mean, here you are most of you are group theorists. But it's also well known that in ring theory, in fact, there is a similar class of problems of studying rings with exotic prescribed properties. And there is even lists of such problems, solved and unsolved, uh, in reports of Yukin Zimanov and Agatis Mokhinovich. And, and let me mention some of these problems. So uh, I'll mention some problems for that are stated for division algebras, but those are right. But many other problems stated for other types of algebras. But for division algebras, well, the first is Kurush problem for division algebras. It is stated as follows. So suppose R is finally generated associative division algebra over the field K, and it satisfies the property that every element of R is algebraic. 
that is, it is a root of some polynomial of the case. And the question is, is the algebra R finitely di dimensional as a vector space over K? Well, at, at some point it is analog of Burnside problem. Yeah? Here we have algebraic elements that are roots of polynomials, this kind of restriction. And again, it has two cases. The, the first case is when the degree of polynomials is unbounded. And in general, this problem for division algebras is still open. And answer, positive answer, we have only for some particular cases. For k uncountable, k finite, and k with only uh, finite algebraic field extension, <coughs> uh, in particular for k algebraically closed. And, uh, un and bounded version of these problems, then degree of polynomials is bounded by some constant. And unlike situation in groups, in this case, there is a positive solution, and even without the assumption that our algebra is division. So somehow in groups, you see, situation is somehow different. And another green problem that I want to mention is problem that we can consider as analog of constructing of Tarski monster in groups. It is a problem how to construct a non commutative division algebra such that all its proper sub algebras are commuted. And this problem is still open. And you see. Uh, I would like to mention that unlike situation in groups where we have this uniform approach, how to construct these big objects with exotic properties, I mean, well, the ideas of small constellation has common usage in this topic. <coughs> in real situation is different. So, in fact, every construction of these exotic rings, it involves some special technique, special references to structure of a ring. So, in fact, there is no uniform approach. And our work is a first step to uh, produce this uniform approach in ring theory. So I'll try to present uh, our approach, how to introduce group-like small constellation theory in rings. OK, so I mentioned the list of famous ring problems. And one of the problems, but it wasn't in my list, so I'll mention it now, uh, gave us initial motiv motivation to start this topic. So consider the following question. Is a division algebra with a finitely generated multiplicative group necessarily finite? You see that's a quite an old problem, and it's attributed to different people. Uh, so in fact, it's not exactly known who was the first who stated this question. But it was widely discussed, in fact, in the 70s. And just to, uh, to show you the general situation, let me say that, for example, in commutative case for fields, this question is quite easy. It is known that a field has finitely generated multiplicative group if and only if K is a finite field. And in fact, this is not so difficult result. Probably theorem is even to <laughs> well, probably I should call it proposition because it's really quite easy thing to show it. And for example, for the field of rational numbers, you can see it very intuitively because if you take finite number of fractions, there 
mm, denominators has only finitely many prime divisors, so you generate only something with uh, denominators with finitely many prime divisors. That is, of course, not the whole rational numbers. Okay. So this problem for division algebras in non-commutative case is still open, but let me say that we have a clear program how to produce a counterexample, how to produce a division algebra of infinite dimension over its center with finitely generated multiplicative group. Well, it's. I would like to say that it's not yet a theorem, it's our current work in progress. So, that's all that I want to say at that, at that point. So, our general, general way how we want to, to do that is the following. So, we take a free group of finite rank, and we take a group algebra over field Z2. In fact, we can take any finite field, but just we take Z2 for uh, making our computations easier. So, in fact, our practical goal is to construct the quotient ring such that sum of every two monomials is equal to either two monomial or is equal to zero. So, uh, if we construct this object and prove that it's infinitely dimensional, then it would be the desired uh, division algebra. So but, so, but let me again say that it's not constructed yet. And now I want to present the first step of this construction. Namely, the first step is to equate at least one binomial to a single binomial. And so our paper describes this step, and our further plan is to iterate this procedure, then to uh, <coughs> equate the next binomial to a monomial, next, next, and do it infinitely many times. And so in this talk, first I want to present uh, how we process this first step, is, uh, first step of our iteration and to present the structure of the object that we obtain after this first step. So let us move to concrete problem. So we consider group algebra of our free group and W is an arbitrary element of F. Uh, well, further in the, this talk, uh, I'll call uh, elements of the three groups monomials. So don't be surprised, I always call them monomials. So uh, W is our arbitrary monomial. So we consider an ideal generated by this polynomial, V inverse plus 1 plus W. So in the quotient ring, we have the relation V inverse is equal 1 plus W. <coughs> well, uh, I use here V inverse and not V by some technical reasons, some matter of convenience. Yeah. But in fact, V inverse is a monomial. So our goal is to construct a linear basis of this ring, so to obtain the full information of structure of this object. I'm sorry, do you have another V here that you're choosing? Where, where is the inverse coming from in this slide? Oh, I'll say it in a minute. So, but before we achieve, achieve this goal, we have a natural question. Why at least our quotient tree is non-trivial? And in fact, this question it looks simpler, but in fact, it's more or less the same as our goal, as a description of explicit structure, because it's not so easy to answer the question why quotient ring is not trivial. You know, it's like 
situation with group given by generators and defining relations. <laughs> Usually we can't even say whether this group is trivial in the same situation as the groups. And the answer is yes, of course, in general, there's no reason to obtain the non trivial quotient ring, in fact. Uh, and since choice of V is in our hands, we choose our V in a very special way. And this choice allows us to answer this question and to achieve our goal. And in fact, application of small constellation ideas starts exactly from this point, exactly from special choice of V. So we choose V of this form. So we take two uh, integers alpha and beta. Alpha is much bigger than the length of V and the segment alpha beta is also long. And we can see the monomial x to the alpha y, x alpha plus one y, etc. And you see, this monomial has very good property. Well, consider subword of V. And suppose this subword is long enough, so it contains at least two letters of Y inside. But then it's easy to see that this subword has a unique occurrence inside V, because two letters of Y fixed power of X between them. So that's why this monomial V exhibits small cancellation properties. And this special choice allows us to really to work with our object. So X and Y are generators of our field? Yes, X and Y are letters from our generating set. <coughs> okay, so now let me present objects that we are working with and give necessary definitions in order to uh, present our results on structure of the object. So we consider first the monomials in words VW. So just <coughs> monomials of the form that I present. And our main set of monomials uh, is subwords of such monomials. I mean subwords in usual sense. I mean that they can start somewhere inside V and end, end somewhere inside V or inside W. So they're kind of fractional. So we call subwords of these monomials generalized fractional power. And we define an additive measure on our generalized fractional powers as follows. So for subwords of V, we count, we count number of letters Y inside subwords and normalize it. For subwords of V inverse, we calculate number of Y inverse. And for subwords of W, we say that measure is equal to zero. And then we continue it additively to arbitrary generalized fractional power. And let me say that it's a reasonable assumption to say that this measure is equal to zero because in fact, from our choice of V, it follows that usual Word length of V is much, much smaller than length of, uh, our usual word length of W is much, much smaller with respect to length of V. So somehow it's really of measure zero. And also for technical usage, we will need two constants, epsilon and tau, and epsilon is somehow very natural value because it represents uh, length of 
subverts of V that doesn't have unique occurrence inside V. Okay, so, so now let me define probably the main object that we are dealing with in our work. It is called the chart of a monomial. So we consider again a monomial and we consider maximal occurrences of generalized fractional powers inside this monomial. Maximal in a sense that we can't prolong them inside you, can prolong them to the left or to the right. And we are interested in maximal occurrences uh, of big enough measure. We don't consider too small occurrences. And we call this set the charts of U and corresponding occurrences we call uh, members of the chart. So let me consider two situations. In general, if our V is something arbitrary, not under our control. Of course, we can obtain a very difficult picture. Well, I represent monomials as segments and their subgroups as subsegments. Of course, in general case, we obtain something very difficult. These members of the chart can locate very chaotic inside you. But our case is much, much better. In our case, we observe the following property. If two occurrences has too large overlap, namely overlap of measure greater than epsilon, we just can glue them to one generalized fractional power. And it's because of our special choice of monomial V. So, in fact, in our case, members of the chart are locating in very easy and clear way. In fact, they are either separated from each other or touched at a point, or they have small overlap, overlap <coughs> measure not greater than epsilon. In fact, in our case, since our measure has kind of discrete steps, possible measures of our overlaps are either zero or epsilon. Okay. So now let me say about the next important thing that we use, but I'll start with group situation. So suppose we have small constellation group, but this definition makes sense for every group given by generators and defining relations. But I speak about small constellation group as our main example. So suppose we have small constellation group, uh, and its presentation, and some relation is split into two parts, M1, M2 inverse. And suppose we have a monomial U, uh, L, M1, R, and if we do it, the transition L, M1, R goes to L, M2, R, these two elements, these two elements, of course, represent uh, the same element in our group. And usually this transition is called a turn. And this picture shows why this transi transition is reasonable to call a turn, because it's kind of weird. Take this part of relator and substitute by its complement and obtain kind of a bubble. And in our case, we define similar transformation, but in our case, situation is more complicated. So first, we need to extend our set of generators of the ideal. I don't want to give a precise definition here because it's a bit technical. Just let me say that this set of generators is big enough. So if we take all monomials that 
take place inside these generators, we uh, obtain all generalized fractional powers. So just keep in mind that our expanded set of generators has a form of sums of generalized fractional powers, but of some special clever chosen form. So, okay, we have this new set of generators and we define a similar transformation. So assume our monomial is of the form again L M H R. Then we, we can do the transition from this monomial to this sum where M I the rest of monomials from the relator, then this element and that sum represent the same element in our quotient algebra. And the transition from this monomial to this sum, we call a multi-term. It's just natural generalization of this group situation. But let me notice the significant difference between situation with turns in groups and situation with multi-turns in algebras. So for a small constellation group we again can define uh, the chart of the monomial just in the same way like maximal occurrences of subrelations and, and so suppose M1 is member of the chart of U and we perform a turn as above, but M2 is very, very short, and probably is equal to 1. So what we know about small constellation group? We know that occurrences of big enough subgroups of, relate, of relators are occurred in in the unique way, but we don't know anything about short subgroups. We don't have such a property for short subgroups. So what we can obtain? We can obtain that this M2 is very short. So this member of the chart and that member of the chart just glued together using this small M2. And Initially, we have three members of the chart, this, this, and this. But after a turn, we obtain only one member of the chart. So our chart degenerates. So, okay, but in rings, we have even more difficult situation. First, let me show you an example. So, assume our U again a monomial, and let me split V and into two parts. This is VI is some initial segment of V, VF is some final segment of V. And suppose our U is of the form L, this initial segment of V, the whole V, final segment of V, and some right part. And let us consider multi-turn that caused by transformation V maps to VW plus one. Of course, inside our ideal, we have this relation V uh, plus VW plus one. Yeah, it's trivial obtained from V inverse plus one plus W. So what we have then for you. So we obtain that our U maps to this sum where in the first member we substitute V by VW and in second member we substitute V by 1. And then in the second name, uh, member this subvert and that subvert glued to the single generalized fractional power. 
So again, we have degeneration of the chart inside this monomial. But the significant difference is <coughs> that as a result of a multi <coughs> we obtain together non-degenerated monomial and degenerated monomial. Because in groups, the result of turn is one monomial, and it is either degenerated or non-degenerated. But here, inside the result of one multi turn we have both situation. And it's one of the main differences uh, that we obtain in rings and, the, and that make our life much more difficult. So now I want to present our structure theorem, but first I need to introduce some technical definitions. So we use a special set of generators of I when we define the multi term. Here I need some letter to denote them, I denote them by D. So assume this sum of monomials inside D. Let me remind that mi are generalized fractional powers if this sum is inside D. So then we call monomials mi inside this sum incident monomials. So we need to <coughs> define a special set of monomials that comes from an arbitrary monomial U. So suppose our U is arbitrary monomial. We consider its char, and we start to uh, replace consecutively its members of the char by the incident monomials. We replace, 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 and as a result of finitely many replacements, we obtain some new monomial. So all monomials that we can obtain uh, using this procedure, we call derived monomials of U. So, and the space that it, ah, here I have an, an example, just a simple example of what can happen. So suppose U again of this form, MH is a member of the chart, and J is an incident monomial, so here we just replace MH by MJ, and the obtained monomial L and J are is a direct monomial. For example, it's the simplest example of direct monomial. And we denote a linear space generated by de direct monomial with this angle brackets with small letter D to say that it's generated not only by U. And these brackets here mean linear generation, not a ring generating. So we also need to define special subspaces inside our space of derived monomials. So the first subspace I denoted L U D. These are derived monomials that are degenerated. And here I say that these are monomials with less number of members of the chart than U, but I put these characteristics in quotes because in real life, unfortunately, we need more difficult uh, characteristics, but still number of members of the chart give us pretty good intuition of what happened. So you can think in these terms. And another space that we need, I denoted by DP of U, it's linear dependences on derived monomials that comes from our elements from D, our special generators. And here I have a simple example in what sense they come from D. Yeah? If we have this monomial and sum that belongs to D, 
then if we multiply this sum from by this L part from the left and R part from the right, we obtain a, again a linear dependence, and it is a linear dependence of on the space of derived monomials. That's a, the sense how they comes from D. So now I can uh, finally formulate our result. So suppose I is our ideal that I uh, told generated by V inverse plus Y plus W with specially chosen V, then our quotient ring as a vector space is equal to a direct sum of these smaller spaces. Yes, so uh, derived monomials of UI, modular dependencies on these derived monomials plus degenerated part of these derived monomials. And each space in this sum, we take only once. In fact, these spaces has, <coughs> they're nice, they have very simple and clear structure. And here I put this structure, Pro probably it looks not so clear <laughs> because it's a big technical result, but uh, I want to say that it behaves like tensor product of smaller spaces and these spaces A, J, I, they, are, they just correspond to uh, J's position of the chart of UI. They generated by generalized fractional powers that are incident to J's member of the chart. And also, let me notice <coughs> that if we want to choose a linear basis for this space, now we just need to choose linear basis for this small quotient space, and that's all then. After that, of course, we have linear basis for the whole space. And moreover, in fact, this result is presented in a bit abstract way, but in fact we have an explicit procedure how to embed basis elements that we uh, choose in these spaces inside the whole space. And also we have an explicit procedure how to decompose uh, a given element. And in some sense, this procedure is similar to Dan algorithm in groups. So it's purely explicit process. So somehow, if you ask me for an analog in groups of these results, uh, I would like to say that it's quite similar to a solution of a word problem. Um. So in this case, you explicitly see that uh, you have non-trivial, a non-trivial basis. Uh, let me say that. Uh, in fact, we, in order to say that we have some non-trivial spaces here, we need to work a bit. But it's, in fact, it's easy to see because I don't want to uh, use again technical definitions. But inside our quotient rings, there exist monomials. Uh, that are certain analogs of quasi-geodesics and groups. And if we take spaces that are generated by this uh, certain quasi-geodesics, then these spaces are non-trivial. So, you see, we obtained our desired properties. So, we show that our object is non-trivial and moreover we obtain an 
explicit description of this object, and this is, in fact, this explicit description allows us to do the next step of iteration, because our aim is to iterate the procedure. This description allows to iterate. And also, the second part that I want to tell you is the following. In fact, when we studied this particular quotient ring, we understood that, in fact, we use very restricted number of properties of uh, our ideal I. And all of them, of course, comes from special choice of V, but still it is restricted number of properties. And in fact, we don't use much our concrete form of generators. So that allows us to uh, formulate these, uh, these conditions in formal axiomatic form. And these conditions are reasonable to call uh, group-like small constellation condition for rings. And now let me show you this kind of condition. So again, suppose we have group algebra over a field K. Here we can take any field K, it doesn't matter. So we take our ideal I generated by these polynomials, M I J are monomials again, gamma I J are elements from the field. And for technical convenience, I introduce this set of generators of ideal and set of monomials that appear inside generators. And if we compare it with the previous uh, consideration, then this is exactly that expanded set of generators and M is the set of all generalized fractional powers. And here we also need to uh, assume that there is an additive measure lambda on these monomials. And unfortunately, we don't have any uniform approach to introduce this measure, so we need to introduce it. We need to introduce it somehow <coughs> in each particular case. And again, we fix two small constants for technical usage. And our conditions are as follows. Well, the first condition, I call it condition zero because it's a simple technical condition. We say that if we have some generator inside D, then if we multiply it by some constants from the field, we again obtain some generator from D. Just to work with our generators as with linear space. So, the next condition is the following. Uh, suppose, again, we have this sum in D. We take a certain monomial that is long enough. And suppose this monomial can, and suppose A is a letter from our alphabet. And suppose our monomial either can be prolonged by A, or it starts with a in minus 1. I mean in its reduced expression. Then we require that uh, product of our generator with A again in, belongs to our set of generators. And this condition we need from the right side and from the left side. And right, and let me say that this condition is pure analog of, for, of being closed under cyclic shifts for presentation. Yeah. Nothing, nothing interesting. So uh, another condition that is one of the main it's small consolation condition. Unfortunately, we can't state it like in groups 
uh, that big pieces of generators uniquely uh, occurs inside relations because even in our previous example, for example, subword V uh, can uh, can be occurred in different relations. Relations and subword V of course is very long. So we need to formulate it in the following way. We say that if we have two monomials that participate in generators, AC and CB, and the overlap is big, then we require to be able to glue them together. And the, the second one, I don't want to say much about that, it's just the form of, of the same condition, but in a form that is easier to use for us. But in fact, the main idea is in, inside this condition. This is for every I1 and I2? Uh, what are I1 and I2 in this condition? No, no, we say that if there exists oh, okay. some I1 from the first sum and I2 from the second sum, then we could add. Okay. And the next condition, <coughs> we call it transversality condition. And this condition states the following. If we have a generator, then we require that there exist monomials Mi1 and Mi2 inside this sum such that their sum uh, the, such that sum of the, their measures is long enough. In fact we can put here another constant but one is quite convenient. Well let me say that this condition is kind of <coughs> pure real condition. Looking at small consolation group it's quite difficult to notice this condition and to formulate it explicitly because well in groups it's somehow trivially satisfied if you have small consolation condition but in rings we need to state it explicitly and from the other hand it's quite natural because from this condition it follows that we can't have relators such that measure of all monomials are very small. And why it's natural? Because, well, in fact, we study everything using the chart of the world. And the chart is long enough uh, occurrences. But if we have relation like this, where all uh, monomials are small, then we just can't notice this, this relation looking at the chart of the world. And if we can't notice this relation, then all our approach fails, yeah? because it's based on uh, considering long appearances. And the last condition, we call it non-degeneracy condition, and it is just a pure analog of having quasi-geodesics inside uh, our quotient algebra. So it's again formulated in a big technical way, but it's just a having of this quasi-geodesics that non-degenerate and generates everything. So the result is, the result is uh, that if the condition, uh, conditions above satisfy, then we have absolutely the same description for the quotient ring and the same uh, process of embedding of basis elements from small spaces and the same explicit procedure of decomposition of the elements. And I stop it here. Questions? Comments? Is this with
efficiency you had more reactions and such a theorem would still be true? Yes, it's in fact it doesn't matter either finite or infinite set of relations we consider. If they satisfy all the conditions that I stated, everything works. Is there or could there be any overlap between the conditions you laid out here and um, the Golachev Ravage condition, for instance? I think no. Golachev Ravage used completely different ideas for from small constellations. It can be called small constellation, and then the next, next step is what you're telling you. Right. So, how. How is this going to make the multiplicative proof finitely generate? Ah, you see, oh. let me show the one of the slides at the beginning. So you see that our free group is finitely generated. Uh, our sum of every set of monomials is monomials. Fine. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about some free group. Yeah, it is fine to generate. So that's the point. So thank you very much. Um.